In today's video, we're diving into the always handy Collections module. Collections has a great assortment of data types that every Python programmer should know. We'll break it down into three main sections, named tuples, decks, and counter, followed by chain map, default dict, and order dict, and finally, we'll wrap it up with a quick talk about user dict, user list, and user strings. My name is Jake, and this is the Python Standard Library. Tuples are a common data structure in Python and offer great functionality, but can be a little confusing when you're picking specific data out of them using indices. Take the example we have on screen. BNW corresponds to a specific book. And in the tuple, the first position, we have the name of the book, Brave New World, followed by the author, and then finally, the year that is published. If we want to pull data out of this using normal tuple notation, say we want to get the author out, we have to use one for the indice, and we pull out Aldous Huxley. That's not too bad when you have your tuple defined pretty close to when you're using it, and when the people reading through your code understand what each position is. But this often isn't the case. And there are a few alternatives to this. You could either construct a dictionary with keys and values. You could create a new class to store all this in, or as you can likely guess by the context of our editor, you can also use named tuples. To create a new tuple for our book example here, we'll store it to a new book variable and set it equal to the result of calling name tuple. And the arguments for this name tuple are going to be the name of it, which we'll call book, followed by the names corresponding to the positional entries for each field. So our first one is going to be title, followed by author, and then year. And now we have a new name tuple that we can create called book. Now we need to do to fix our example down below using our name tuple is to put it up here and then just call our new book name tuple with it. And if we load our file, we now have BNW, which is our new name tuple, which of course we can still use the positional notation for tuples to get out the author, or we can now say dot author and pull out our author. So to show this off, I'll give you two different print statements. Okay, now we have two different versions of this print statement. The first one's a little bit more verbose, but it's more clear what we're accessing from our name tuple. Conversely, the second one is a little shorter, but we don't really know what we're accessing from each element of the name tuple. However, when we run this, we see we get the same output for each. Another neat thing you can do with name tuples is convert it into a dictionary, which we'll also print out. So there's a lot more that we can do with named tuples, but that's not really the focus of this video. If you want me to do a deep dive into them, let me know in the comments. But for now, we've got to move on to DEX. Double-ended queues, or DEX for short, are basically list-like containers with fast appends and pops on either end of them, which are most commonly used for flexible stacks and queues. To show you what that looks like, let's create a new deck now, which can take two arguments. First is going to be an interval, and then the second is going to be a max length. Now max length is optional, and by default, if you leave it out, it won't have a max length set. So it can grow basically as much as your system has space for. And for the iterable in our case, we'll just pass in a tuple three, four, five. Cool. So we have a new deck. And the nice thing about this is the ability to operate on both ends of the deck. We can do so with its append methods. And you see, we have an option to either append or append left. So we'll just do append and we'll append in the integer six. And then we'll also append left with the integer two. If we look at our deck now, we see we have two, three, four, five, six. Awesome. So we operated on both ends of that. The same is true also for getting values out of the deck. We can either use a normal pop, which gives us the right end of the queue, or as you've likely guessed, we can also pop left, which gives us the left-hand side of the queue. If we look at our queue now, we're back to its original state. Really nice thing about these operations is that they are thread safe and a great way to coordinate information between multiple threads. So to really push this double ended functionality home, I'm going to define a new function here to check to see if something is a palindrome, which is going to take in some kind of string that represents a word. And quite simply, it'll just return true if the given word is a palindrome. And this is actually going to be pretty simple to do. We'll create a new deck here, passing in our word. And if you remember that all strings are iterables, that'll give us each character broken down as an individual element within our deck. We can see that below with our test string. So all we have to do to see if something is a palindrome is to check to make sure that we have at least two elements in our deck 
And we can do a simple comparison, checking that the left character should be equal to the right character. So if we check the inverse of this, and if this condition is true, we simply return false. Otherwise, we continue through our loop. And if we make it all the way down to the bottom here, we can return true, that it is in fact a palindrome. Then we'll test this with a couple of words. So our first word is going to be one of the most famous palindromes, which is race car. And then word two is not going to be a palindrome, so this can be really anything we want, like alphabet. And then we'll test this out with two print statements, which I'll write out now. Okay, we have our palindrome test, so let's run the script and see what happens. We see race car is a palindrome, true. Alphabet is a palindrome, false. Nice. So we now have completed our demonstration. There's a ton of things you can do with DEX, which is evident by how commonly you'll see this through Python code bases. So definitely something that's going to come in handy. Okay, let's move on to counters. Now counters are one of those things that you likely won't need often, but when you do need it, it really comes in handy. And really the core functionality of counters are pretty simple. You effectively just pass in some iterable again. For example, we could even pass in a string like this, and we get a counter object back. And what this tells us is how many times it encountered a single element within that iterable. And since strings are broken down by default on a per character basis, it's going to give us the amount of times that it encountered each of these characters here. We see space is the most common, followed by T, E, S, I, etc. We also could have done the same thing by splitting it into individual words. This time the counter isn't nearly as helpful because remarkably that sentence didn't repeat a single word. Now it does have a number of nice helper functions available for it, including elements, which is an iterable that we can expand that repeats everything in the counter by how many times it has been counted. Now again, with that sentence, that's not very exciting because everything has been encountered once and it actually just recreates the sentence entirely. However, if we were to go to our non-split example with count and then create a list of those elements again, we'll see something a bit different. And here we see a bunch of T's, H's, I's, etc. This by itself might seem a little bit weird. I'm not sure how many times you'll need to use something like this, but you can also keep this trick in mind if you need an alternate way to populate a list with a default value some amount of times. Count also has some other common methods like most common, where you can get the three most common elements from the counter. And you can also get a total for all elements encountered. Okay, let's do something a bit interesting with this example to finish off counters. And to do this, I'm gonna need to add some additional imports. Okay, so there's quite a few more things that are going on right now. But basically what this now does is it's going to read the source code of this file itself. It's then gonna go through a process of tokenizing the code and pulling out just the actual names from the code itself. So we don't really get things like parentheses or expressions and other notation like this. Then it's gonna pass that into a counter, print out the total number of tokens, the five most common tokens, and the three least common tokens. Okay, so with that saved, let's run it and see what happens. And here we go. We had 49 tokens total, the five most common being import tokenize tokens, token counter, and from. And the three least common being total, name, and type. Kind of neat. So any number of changes that we make to the source code is going to change the output of what we see below. A bit of a strange example, but hey, this is a counter and they're not super exciting by themselves. But speaking of exciting, let's move over to default dicks. Now dictionaries are a great versatile data structure in Python and likely the best choice to use in a lot of situations. But they can still be a bit awkward to work with. Say for example, we wanted to replicate the counter behavior on our own by creating a new counter dictionary here. And what we want to do is count the instances and the types of fruit in this list up above. Of course, we can iterate over the word list, but we can't just say counter and then access the word element and increment it by one because the first time that we encounter a word, it's not gonna exist in the dictionary yet. So instead what we have to do, check to see if the word is in our counter dictionary. If so, then we can increment it. Otherwise, we need to set the initial value. Well, this is where default dicks can come in to help because with the default dictionary, we can specify what the default values should be. And if we're using basic data types, 
like integer strings, dictionaries, etc., they'll have default values set. And when we create this default dictionary, we'll see the actual dictionary itself currently doesn't have anything in it. We see the default value factory on the left. Now, if we try to access a value in there, like apple, while this would normally complain with the normal dictionary, our default dictionary gives us that default value. And if we look at it now, we see that apple has been added into it. This is what's going to give us the ability to really shrink down the check above. Because we could just take something, instead of checking to see that value already exists, we could just say plus equals one. Now you can see we've added one grape to our dictionary. Now another place that you'll commonly see this is when dealing with dictionaries that have nested lists in them. Because we can just take our default dict, instead of checking to see if a list already exists, we can just append a value directly to it. So that both creates the list and appends the value. So we don't need to keep checking to see if it already exists. We know that it will. All right, let's use that modifier example above. So we'll change counter from being a normal dictionary to a default dict, which will be an integer. And we can get rid of this check altogether, remove the indentation for this line, and then delete the else statement. And there we go. That's all nice and compact. And we don't have to worry about extra conditionals in our for loop. But let's take this one step further. Now I said that the argument that you pass into default dict is a factory, right? Well, this can be any function that provides a default value. But what if we wanted a default dict that could be infinitely nested? Well, we'll just create an infinite dict factory. And all this will do is return a default dict that will also use this infinite dict function recursively. So now we can create an infinite dict either by repeating this line or just calling the function itself. And this gives us the ability to do something like this, which would pretty much be unheard of with a normal dictionary. So if we load this file, first we'll see our counter dict from above get printed out, telling us that we had one orange, three apples, two watermelons, and one grape. And we'll also have access to our infinite dict. And while that looks a bit crazy because it has all of the factory functions in there, we can see that the nested dictionaries have first, second, third, and fourth having a value of 42. And we can add on to this as much as we'd like, adding another key under the second to give us another in 17. There are of course other cool things you can do with default dicks, but we have to move on now to ordered dicks. Prior to Python 3.7, dictionary order wasn't something that was guaranteed by the language itself. So ordered dicks were used to guarantee a specific ordering with dictionaries. Now, since Python 3.7, dictionary ordering is now guaranteed, so ordered dicks aren't nearly as commonly used anymore. However, it does still have some interesting functionality that I'll show off quickly that you could do other ways, but it's still something interesting you can do with ordered dicks. So what we'll do is we'll create a new dictionary called AskDict which will be an ordered dict passing in our task here. So of course we can still access items within this task dict just like any other dictionary by its key and update its status to complete. Now the additional functionality that I want to show off with ordered dicts today is that you can move around the orders of the keys using a special method called move to end. And what this will do is we'll take the second task and push it down in the dictionary till it's the last key available. Now interestingly enough, we can do the inverse. So if we were to create a new task, by default, this would be moved to the end of the dictionary. However, move to end takes another argument. You can specify last is equal to false. By default, last is set to true. But when you say false, the end that it's going to choose is going to be the beginning of the dictionary. So if we were to print these out and run it, we'll see that task four, the last thing to be added is at the beginning of the dictionary, followed by one and three, which are still to do. And then task two, which has been completed and moved down to the end, is at the bottom of the dictionary. So even though we don't need order dicks to guarantee key order, we can still use it to manipulate the order of keys within a dictionary. Now, there's other ways you can do that as well that you don't have to use order dicks, but I think this is a pretty convenient and clear way to do it. All right, let's move on to another dictionary helper, which is definitely underutilized in my opinion, but it's very powerful. So chain maps are a neat way to combine multiple dictionaries together without having to create or update existing dictionary. So if we were to create a new chain map, all we have to do is create an instance of chain map passing in both of these dictionaries. And you can chain together multiple dictionaries. So now we have a new chain map, which contains D1 as well as D2. Now there are a few different rules that you'll need to keep in mind when working with chain maps. 
One is that there is a precedent order for the dictionaries within the map, meaning the earlier on a dictionary is added to the chain map, the higher priority it has. So although D1 and D2 both have apple, if we were to access the value of apple according to the chain map, we see we get the value from D1. Additionally, if we were to update this value, say to 5, we see that D1 has been modified and D2 has been left alone. We can also confirm this by looking at the D1 dictionary again. So it operates on the underlying dictionaries. Now with this, and this may seem a bit counterintuitive, is how updates work when things aren't in the primary dictionary. So in D1, we do not have banana. So if we go ahead and try to update banana in our chain map and set it equal to, let's say four, and look at the CM again, we see banana has been added to D1. It hasn't updated the value of banana in D2. Again, we can confirm this by looking back at the D1 dictionary. Now, with this bit of weirdness aside, I want to see you use this chain map behavior in something that's much more applicable to the real world. And this comes down to CLI application design. So for CLI applications, there's typically three main ways that you can set a configuration value. One is through static configuration files. Two is through environment variables. And then three is command line overrides. And each of these has an order of priority with static files being the lowest priority, followed by environment variables, and then command line arguments. Basically from the least to most easily mutable. So we can keep that in mind and we can build out a quick CLI script to demonstrate this behavior. So I'll write that out now and bring you back when I'm done. All right, here we are. So let's walk through this real quick. We're going to emulate loaded static settings just by having a static dictionary defined at the top of the file. Could have used nanoconf, but I'd like to keep external dependencies to a minimum. Next, we're going to use OS to attempt to load three different environment variables. If they're set, that's going to be app host, port, and debug. If anything isn't set, then we're going to purge that. So we're only left with a dictionary of actually set environment variables. Next is our command line arguments, again, corresponding to host, port, and whether it's debug, all pretty standard. And we're going to purge any command line arguments that aren't set, just so we keep our dictionary clean. Finally, we're going to create our combined settings by chain mapping together our command line args, followed by environment variable settings, and then static file settings. So remember, keeping these in order of precedent from first being most important to last being least important. Our CLI script will prefer command line arguments. If those aren't set, it'll fall back to environment variable settings. And if those aren't set, finally, static file settings. So at the very end, it's going to print out what has been set for each. So with that in mind, let's test this out. Give ourselves quite a bit more room. And we see our help text is displaying fine. That's good. Let's run it without any environment variables and without any command line arguments being set. And we see localhost, 8080, and debug false. Cool. So now let's try some of those environment variables. Looking up above, we can set app port equal to 123. And if we run our app again, we see port has been overridden to 123. But if we set dash dash port equal to 59, we see that port has been overridden to 59. Awesome. So that's all working exactly as expected. And the beautiful thing about this is that each of these dictionaries still lives independently from one another. So the rest of our application could always look to see what environment variables have been set, as well as static file settings independently of the combined settings that we're using here. All right, now it's time to shift to our last section, which is our base classes. So the final interesting thing that Collections currently offers are these user versions of dictionaries, lists, and strings. Now it isn't as hard anymore to directly inherit from strings, dictionaries, and lists. However, it still may be a better practice to use things like these user classes because each of them, whether it's a dictionary, list, or string, provides you this data attribute where you can directly work against that underlying data structure. In this case, the dictionary. And that's really the biggest thing to these user classes that's different than normal dictionary lists or strings is that since it has this dot data attribute, it may be easier for you to work with. So I just put a quick implementation of a simple version of the Python box library 
If you've never used Python box before or adder dict, it's a neat way to get dictionary keys as attributes or using dotted notation to access keys within a dictionary. Kind of like what we did earlier with name tuples. So there's nothing crazily special here. We're just going to override a few magic methods like get adder. When something tries to use attribute access on our dictionary, we just check to see if the key is in the dictionary. And if so, return the value. Otherwise, we're going to raise an attribute error. And the same thing for setting a value. Now, there is a quick override we have to do for data here, because if it is self.data, like we've been using all this time, we just end up in a recursive loop. And we can even allow users to directly delete an attribute, as we'll see at the end of the script. Okay, so to create it, we're going to create a new box instance, passing in a dictionary. And instead of our users having to pull out the name of our character by key, they can just use character.name. So it's a bit easier for them to work with this dictionary. Same thing for setting a new value. And then finally, deleting a value. I guess at the end, we can also print out the character. Okay, let's run that and see what happens. And here we see our character's name, species, and rank are correct. Then we overrode his rank with captain, print it out again. And finally, we see the resulting dictionary after deleting the rank. Beautiful. And that wraps up this video. And this stop on the Python standard library tour. If you learned something new, please consider subscribing to the channel and sharing this video with your friends. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments section below. And as always, thanks for watching.